Well, it looks like oil's been making another charge up. I, you know, I think it has to do with actually from uh, Russian tensions, too. Uh, palladium, if you noticed, it's around 780. It's charging up to close to 800. And this is partly due to, um, well, it's not really realistic fears. You know, there's almost like this realistic, there's almost like this in the back of their mind that the Russians, due to sanctions, are probably going to try to restrict or do something with the availability of palladium on the world market. And But, you know, the deal is, actually, the Russians would have always wanted to do this uh, since day one because they actually supply the world market with 43% of the global palladium every year. And uh, they have huge stockpiles going back to all this times in the 30s with all the slave gulag labor they accumulated all this palladium over those decades and they did not find a major use for palladium until the catalytic converter was developed on a car and that's not the only use of palladium but but you know historically I have to point this out again back in 2001 palladium actually skyrocketed to four times the price of gold four times the price of gold so I mean, yeah, it was only like a little, like a thousand fifty or something like that, but still, it was four times. I think it was over four times actually, but it was a fear, you know. It's a, it's a fear monger type thing, um, and I suspect that Ford Motor Company probably had some. There were some shenanigans going on there because Ford Motor Company basically bought a lot at the high, and I'm thinking, eh, I don't think they would have been that stupid, but. The same type of deal could come up again, and it could all be psychological. Because there's always been an impetus for Russia to want to send the price of palladium up to the roof if they could. But I guess they have too much in uh, stockpiled up, and that's been a closely guarded secret. But I still, I always said and always maintain, I think palladium is going to be one of your best metals overall for price action. But I still think everything's going to go up quite a bit. And uh, what we got today going on, like, you know, if you look historically in the past, we had like the dot-com bubble, we had the real estate bubble, and you know what we got today? We got the central bank bubble. That's really what it is. There's QE out the yin-yang. Now, I know Janet Yellen is backing off the steam, right, on a QE. But there's also experts in, well, let's put their experts, I don't know if anybody's an expert in anything, because... No matter what you know, it seems like uh, there's so many varied opinions of the experts that um, most, you know, there's always going to be people who get it wrong that are experts. But it just using common sense on this deal, um, it has a lot of people, you know, a lot of people realize the markets are going up due to QE. And now that she's backing off QE, it's got people worried. And I think what's going to happen is actually. You know, if you look back historically, the long-range expectation for the markets is actually very bad. It's, there's been some studies out that the long-range expectations for corporate bonds, U.S. bonds, performance-wise, and equities is the worst it's been since 1948. There's been some studies that say that, suggest that. And Janet Yellen backing off now uh, could actually bring the markets down quite a bit. You see... It's actually historically true, though, that markets do not always go in sync with the economy. Many times markets have stayed flat when the economy is doing very good, and there's many times, like like in our case here now, the economy is not doing that good, that markets have been going up. But since they're already priced very high for actually what the uh, earnings are, um, it's probably... a damn reasonable bet that in the long term the markets are not going to do well. What I expect is there's going to be this major correction and they're going to put the freaking full steam back on with QE again. Uh, so, you know, I don't know when this is going to happen. It's getting to be like I'm getting a little impatient with it. I wish it would happen. Now, I'm not voting for a collapse of the Western system or a reset or anything like that, but um, I'd like to see this pullback happen now then later, because uh, right now we're in the third longest bull run in U.S. in the last 100 years of U.S. Final, financial history, third longest bull run in the markets. If it lasts till July, it'll be the second longest bull run. 
In other words, the higher it goes, the longer the bull run, the more it corrects. So, you know, I'm not hoping for doom and gloom. I'd rather see the good, healthy correction now and, you know, let them go do the QE and you know, whatever they got to do to fix things again, which would bring the metals back up quite a bit. Um, like I said, one good sign of the metals, though, that things are heating up again is the oil prices. Now, what happened before, the oil prices were moving up, silver started moving up a little bit. The oil's going to lead to charges, which has always been my opinion. They, they were moving up during the Crimea say, situation. Uh, they released some oil from the strategic oil reserve to kind of bring them down. It wasn't much. I mean, it was, it was more like a psychological thing. Uh, you know, I mean, they gave another excuse for it, but it was to bring the price of oil down a little bit. And it went down below 100, but now the WTI is up at a 103. And, um, you know, actually what the Ukraine is paying for oil and natural gas is much higher than what, you know, you're looking at in the Western markets, that's for sure. But it's like the price points I think we're going to be seeing on oil are going to be going quite, quite a bit up as these tensions increase with Russia because... I don't think Vladimir Putin's backing off on any type of front. You know, they got 80,000 troops or so, whatever, on the uh, uh, the border with Ukraine. Also, the U.S. is not sharing intelligence information with the Ukraine for some reason. Supposedly, the reason being that it would, if they shared intelligence information with the Ukraine, um, it would jeopardize how we get the te intelligence, but I think that's a lame excuse. I don't know what their ultimate game is. I'm almost tending to think that if so that something is going to come up fairly soon with Ukraine, with Russia trying to take over eastern Ukraine physically with force. Um, and, you know, it, there will be bloodshed. You know, I mean, there would have been bloodshed in Crimea if you know, if you saw a bunch of... I, I think the troops are under orders not to do anything. That's really why nothing happened. Nothing happened there. Um, you know, actually, if you saw Russians or something coming into uh, an area, <laughs> I mean, it's ludicrous to think that, you know, if they're violating your national sovereignty, uh, it's ludicrous to think that you stand by. But all these type of things are asking to bring up the price of oil, gold, silver, platinum, and palladium. And I think palladium actually, it may not be realistic in this sense because it's, you know, markets are actually fear driven. That's one thing I have I made an observation about. It's almost like markets don't really, aren't really attached to reality. The stock markets, a lot of times they go up during times of economic stagnation. And other times during economic booms, the stock market stayed flat. Uh, psychology has a hell of a lot to do with um, gold and silver. Even though, you know, you could say the fundamentals, this and that, and, you know, it's real money, gold is real money. A lot of it has to have to do with psychology. Um, and markets are basically psychological all the way. That's really how it is. So... A scare that happened like in 2001 where actually palladium went actually well over, I think, four times the price of gold. Um, and you know, that could happen again. There could happen again. It could actually explode. There is a number of indications, and they've been putting this out for the last couple of years or more, actually since 2010, about the Russian stockpiles dwindling and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, maybe they are, maybe they aren't. I don't know. I would assume they have to be because they're having major problems in Norilsk Mine, which is 39% of the world's production. That's most of what Russia, where most of uh, Russia's palladium production is at in Norilsk Mine in northern Siberia. They've been having problems. They pay, from you know what I've read, they pay the workers like double the salary of ordinary miners, but the area is so polluted. There isn't even like a live tree within 20 mile radius of the mine. It's considered one of the most polluted areas on this entire earth. And, you know, it's in other words, you're breathing this crap all the time. So they got to pay miners quite a bit of money to keep things going. And there's been a lot of environmental concerns and things like that. So that it's affecting production. Now, I'm looking at, you know, 
automotive sales globally have been going up. Even though in the United States they're pretty flat, if you look like in China and in India and in Brazil, uh, there's more and more, and also Saudi, you know, also the places where they produce the gasoline, there's more like a stronger middle class coming on where there's more people driving cars. And all these cars, all these new cars require catalysts. You know, 65% of the use of palladium comes from that. So the demand for palladium actually globally has been increasing a lot every year. You know, it's been going up a lot every year. Like it's it's about, I think, 8% increase every year. So, and you look at that, you know, the production problems that are also in South Africa with all the strikes and also what's going on in Russia, I would, you would think that palladium, which is even more rare than platinum, should be well above the price of gold, and ultimately it would have to be, just by fundamentals. Um, you know, something else I mentioned, and I just to reiterate it, you know, if these silver pumpers really wanted to get smart about uh, pushing uh, silver into the hands of more people, my angle would be, you know, not that I, you know, have the power to do this, but I'm just, you know, somebody's going to just run with the ball with this idea, but Argentium sterling silver would be the way to do it. Argentium sterling silver, still true sterling silver, 92.5% silver, but instead of being 7.5% copper, it's 7.5% germanium. And what would happen there, you see what happens with that Argentium sterling silver, it's more lustrous than platinum, it's more lustrous than white gold, and it doesn't tarnish because of the germanium that's in it. Actually, you can have the thing in salt water, it doesn't tarnish. I think it's almost virtually impossible to tarnish. You know, I, it's just that it's not being marketed much. I'm just thinking, you know, they could probably push a billion ounces of this stuff off the shelves just for jewelry purposes. And as a function of jewelry, and even as an investment in jewelry, it would be excellent. But as far as appearance, it would stay far more lustrous than the best white gold. Because white gold, sometimes it depends on what kind it is. Sometimes it has nickel in it. Sometimes it has platinum in it or palladium in it and things like this to make it that, you know, light color, you know. And But you're looking at argentium sterling silver. There's nothing like silver is the most lustrous, most reflective metal going. And if you're combining it with your germanium, it never tarnishes. And so I'm amazed at you know how stupid some people are that they're not pushing this as a product because uh, you know instead of just investment purposes jewelry purposes uh, this should be a really 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 hot ticket item it's amazing I, I shouldn't even put it out there because you know I'd rather get paid as a, uh, a commission for putting this out here because you know some yo-yos with money is gonna push this idea and uh, you know I'd be pushing it I'd be pushing it left and right if you know I had the money to do so you know but um, you know I mean I'm amazed that say Eric Sprott doesn't pick up on this idea for crying out loud I mean it's like I would never be uh, playing like here you want a coin and stick it in a freaking wall place or something and bury it in the ground you know who the hell gives a damn about that people want shiny stuff to wear and uh, that's the best way to press really push to press his metals but anyway, um, it looks like, you know, some of the things that are coming about are, you know, also I have to remember the, the, the reddish colored blood moon is going to be next week. I think it's April 15th. We're going to have the, uh, uh, that's going to be the first blood moon of the Tetrod, which is uh, April 15th, I think, in 2014. The last one is in September of 2015. Now, some of them are making some predictions about, um, you know, a catastrophic global financial problem around the time of the fourth blood moon of September 2015. I am pretty much leaning towards this in a way because, uh, you know, it's been correct uh, before about the Tetrod, what happened with Israel, also what's happened with, um, you know, the seven-year cycle of the Hebrew calendar. You know, 2001 was another, was one, September 11, 2001 was an era, time of the, uh, approximate time of the Hebrew calendar. Uh, September 29th, 2008, which was a narrowly averted, averted a catastrophic meltdown in the actual mar uh, money markets. That was a real, that was actually the height of the financial crisis. 
and um, seven years later it will be the fourth tetrad and that's going to be the next seven year cycle of the Hebrew calendar I, I am actually leaning towards you know it sounds a little superstitious or I don't know I'm leaning towards it actually being accurate and I'm assuming that silver is actually going to take a spike up before it goes down again in 2015 and then it's going to have a final spike up in 2017 so, you know, some of these things with, um, you know, actually I think a lot of these things are interrelated. You know, a lot of people are, you know, they got like tunnel vision one way or the other. They look at astrology one way and they'd say it's this, or they look at science and they're very much orientated that way, or they look at religion and biblical predictions and they're very much orientated that way. A lot of these things can actually coexist together and they seem to be more interrelated than, pe you know, each, you know, all these different opposing teams seem to think. And um, what I think is coming up, though, is there's actually going to be a panic into the metals. There will be. It's uh, It comes all at once. Everything comes at once, like an avalanche. And that's just how this price of silver has always performed over the years. It's actually all at once, and then you're afraid to sell. Um, probably for, uh, you know... I don't even know if we're going to have this end time scenario type thing coming up. I hope not. But, uh, you know, it may be or may not be. But, you know, actually, supposedly, if you look at the religious aspects of the end times, what it really means is the end of an age and the beginning of another age. A tumultuous time and then a beginning of another age. So there's always like, uh, you know, it depends on no matter how bad the problems become, there's always light at the other end of the tunnel. Um... Also, I have to point something else out, because there's a lot of Russia tards and Putin tards out there that seem to always glorify this guy like he's the best thing on Earth and Russia's the best place to be on Earth. You know, um, one of the things I've been critical of in the United States is the health care industry and the pharmaceutical care industry, the pharmaceutical industry, pharmaceutical, the health care industry and the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, in Russia, and you know, particularly like been, I've been pretty critical of some of the ways they try to treat people with cancer and, you know, chemotherapy, if you take it out past, you know, the normal five-year parameter, you take it out to about the 10-year parameter, chemotherapy has like a 98% fail rate. And, you know, you can really downtrodden, you can say the West is bad and all this stuff. In Russia, I have to point this out. There's been a number of suicides of even people that have pretty good money, that have cancer, because in the Russian healthcare system, they're very bad at even giving the drugs even needed for pain management. Pain management. In other words, if you have cancer and you have pain or whatever like that, and you're trying to fight it off, at least maybe you won't feel the pain because you have some drug to alleviate that pain. Which you know they're they're good at doing that in the United States, at least the pain for most part for the most part pain management. In Russia, they're terrible at that. So I mean, a lot of times you know these people that are highly highly critical of the West, they totally totally ignore every single aspect of Russia, and you know their healthcare system in Russia is pretty pretty bad, and it's pretty much a shame because. Um, one of the guy, one of the things I put out that it's, I think is a little bit of a unique angle is about Georges Lukowski. It was originally a Russian immigrant to Paris, France, and he he devised the Lukowski multi-wave oscillator. From basically, he got inspired from speeches from Nikola Tesla. Actually, Tesla kind of just came up with the idea, and uh, um. Georges Lukowski did all the research and actually, you know, made the thing work. You know, Russia could be having gazillions of uh, multi-wave oscillators uh, in their hospitals all over the place, but they don't. And Vladimir Putin has plenty of money to fund it, too, out of his own pocket. He's got loads of money. He's got 40 or $50 billion. He can easily put a million... Um, Lukowski coils and every uh, true ones in every single hospital out there in Russia, but he doesn't. He doesn't give a shit. So it's amazing how people just get behind these people, like you know, 
they're uh, nice people. They're not, you know. There's there's a commonality between the crooks in the uh, West and the crooks in the East and the crooks in China and the crooks in Europe. They all pretty much are the same breed. I don't care what religion they are, what freaking language they speak. They're all the same type of breed. They're all cut from the same cloth. They're out for number one. They don't give a shit about anybody else. It's just how it is. So it's us, the people, against them. Now, I just want to say again, reiterate that, and I've been saying this for some years, and actually it's been good for some years, uh, and it's not been doing you know, that tremendously good, but it's, you know, recently. But I guess, you know, you could say Palladium was, I don't know, some months ago below $700 or just below $700, and now it's had a crease of a good 10%. And I would expect um, the new, the same type of thing that's going to happen here in the future is going to happen as we had in the past. If there's a real panic panic, palladium can go way to hell over the price of gold. What happened in 2001 was they, they there was a rumor that um, the Russian stockpiles were done with. And that's why the price went way to hell up. So if you add that with all the extra demand for palladium, and yes, they will come out with a new a way of getting around palladium if the price of palladium went up to some astronomical ten to twenty thousand dollars an ounce or some crazy crazy number like that, they'll find a way, they'll use something else. Even if palladium and platinum went to ten to twenty thousand dollars an ounce, um, if it went to some crazy price like that. Um, just remember the old axioms of demand destruction and you know, necessity is the mother of all invention. Uh, what happens with these metals, what happens with them is they super spike. They go up like a rocket and you're really going to be guessing exactly where how high is high. They'll go a lot higher than they should go. And when they come down, they're going to fall like a freaking rock. Because, you know, they'll get into unrealistic prices. And that's when people are going to be coming out all over the Internet telling people to buy. And that's where all the little people are going to be coming out and saying, oh, i got to put down all my money on palladium when it's really high. Right now, it's still cheap, even though it's been doing very well. So uh, this thing with Russian tensions is actually going to be very bullish for this metal. So that's basically my emphasis on this video is that, uh, you know... I, you know, I, I hope people, when they look at the palladium, you know, I think the better, I'm going to say this with palladium, uh, as a final note, though, I think the better way to invest in it is in with the little bars, the one ounce bars with the actual assay certificate on it, and get it from a reputable dealer. Um, everything can be faked. And the more it costs, the more... Uh, profitable it is for somebody to fake it. I don't trust the coins to tell you the truth. I don't trust the coins. You know, unless I knew it, I was getting them right from the government mint himself, but the coins are getting to be like, forget it, they're rare as anything. So, uh, but in lieu of not getting palladium, silver is still a fantastic bet. It is going to go up. I just think that oil is going to lead the charge and what will happen is there'll be a panic into the metals if the silver pumpers, you know, if you know, I wish I was working with Eric Sprott in some ways because I tell this guy, you know, don't go out there and freaking make stupid, you know, I know he's not stupid. I mean, he gives you all these facts about, you know, the mines and all this shit and what they're doing with the central banks. Just push the jewelry, the Argentium jewelry. It'll fly off the shelves. It's all you gotta do. It's all you gotta do. It's uh, in his. I mean, there's a gazillion different ways you can push jewelry. A lot of different ways, and nothing is gonna be as lustrous as argentium jewelry that never tarnishes. So, that's one way to actually get people to invest in it without you know putting out all the boring facts on silver. Argentium jewelry, damn it! So Eric Sprott, if you're listening. Pay attention to that. That's free advice, and that'll put create a heavy demand. I know it will. Definitely will.